loops out to left field. Going to be a tough play. Jeter on the run. Makes the play. Wow. And flies into the stands. Oh, what a play by Derek Jeter. Has time. Throws to the back of the end zone. And it is This is the Personal File Podcast. I'm your host, Colton Gesser, back for another show this week. Got a special guest coming on this week. Ironically, between my two teams here, Steve Lehman. He covers the Tennessee Titans for Channel 5 in Nashville. Thanks for coming on, Steve. You bet, Colton. How are you doing? I'm all right, man. I'm all right. I know we tried, ironically, we tried getting this uh, podcast uh, a few weeks ago um, when the Titans' COVID issue came up and it was a big part of the league. Is the league going to shut down? And, uh, here we are. You're on the show a few weeks later, and ironically, my favorite team, the Steelers, are playing the team you cover in the Tennessee Titans. So this actually probably worked out probably for both of us here in this show, I think. Yeah, no, it's going to be fun. And obviously the whole COVID situation is the reason why this game is this weekend. It was supposed to be back in week four when the COVID situation here in Tennessee started. And it was going to be a good game. It was going to be a juicy game. The Steelers and the Titans are kind of old school rivalries from the days of the AFC Central. And so they were going to have lock horns and they were going to be unbeaten. And people were going to talk about it. It was week four, right? Well, now you move it ahead a few weeks and it's week seven and both teams are five and oh, the only other unbeaten in the entire NFL is the Seahawks. So now all of a sudden it's a really juicy game. A lot of people are going to talk about it. A lot of people are going to have their eyes here on Tennessee this weekend. Yeah, I mean, definitely leading off with the COVID stuff. So what did you think when this all first hit the Titans? And ironically, they had that practice that Tannehill threw together at some academy there um, just outside of, I think it was like, what, 20 miles away from Nashville or 20 miles away from the stadium? I forget exactly. Oh, I mean, it's, it's right in, it's right in downtown. I mean, it's but maybe four miles from downtown Nashville. So they didn't, go, they didn't go far. They weren't trying to hide this too much by any means. Yeah, so it's kind of crazy. We, when this first came out, um, kind of talks were, man, the NFL's going to hammer these guys like we never seen before. They just finished up their review. not too, I think it was this week, ironically, and nothing's really happening. They got fined a little bit of money, um, but nothing really hammered down on guys like Tannehill who kind of tossed us together. And ironically, Corey Davis and Adam Humphreys were two of the guys that were on that COVID list, getting Corey Davis back this week. Adam Humphreys was back last week. Um, so what was your overall take of everything that went on? Cause I mean, a lot of people, including myself thought, Oh my goodness, the season's over. Here we go. There's our big first problem with the league. And so what, what do you think? How did the NFL handle it and how did the Titans handle it? So it was an ever evolving story, right? Colton. And, and this is the thing. So we didn't even really notice the very first case that happened with the Titans. And it was a practice squad defensive back named Greg Maven, who got signed, I want to say it was September 21st. And as you know, there's a protocol when you bring in a new guy off the street, quote unquote, that you have to work him through the process of testing to make sure that he actually can integrate in the building. He's not bringing anything in from outside. Well, it turns out as he went through that process and the day he was cleared to sort of join the team, he immediately went on the COVID-19 reserve list. And so clearly it didn't work, or maybe it did, and it prevented him from totally walking inside. But that was sort of the introduction of the virus into St. Thomas Sports Park, the Titans facility. Two days later, defensive play caller, outside linebackers coach Shane Bowen, tested positive. They got the results back right before they were set to leave for the game in Minnesota. And the Titans got together with the league. They went through all the contact tracing protocol. Bowen was sent home into quarantine, and they looked around on the team to try to decipher if there was anyone else who needed to be held out beyond just extra testing that they were going to do that day and then in Minnesota. They did all that stuff. Everyone was clear. Nobody else on the team had it. They go out the next day. They play the Vikings, and they win. They come back to Tennessee. On Monday, they do their regularly scheduled testing, and on Tuesday morning, it blows up with eight cases. And – And that was where the real shock was because everything else was kind of under the radar. We didn't even know Shane Bowen didn't make the trip until basically they got home from the trip and it started to trickle out. And on Monday we reported that, that he tested positive for COVID and he wasn't there, but it still wasn't thought to be that big of a deal. And then you wake up on Tuesday morning and it's 
oh my gosh, there's eight tests and they're shutting down the facility. What in the world is going on here? And even then, I think people thought, okay, well, this is a flare up right here, but if they're shutting down the facility, how much farther can it go on the roster? And they'll be able to get this under control in a couple of days. And we'll just see what happens. And then you just see case after case after case trickle out over the next several days. Ultimately, it got up to 24 cases. So it was clearly the first outbreak within the NFL this year and obviously led to the trepidation so many people had about could they continue the season at that point. The practice you bring up, I think, is what brought the next layer into this. So at first it was just, oh, man, the Titans are getting hit and it's getting hit hard. Is this going to affect this weekend's game against the Steelers? Is it going to affect the NFL season as a whole? Well, then you get this news, and actually, it's amazing. I actually reported that they had this get-together or workout at NBA the day it happened. And the next day, we asked about it, and really the answers were, we've been told now that we need to absolutely not get together, so there won't be anything like that going on. They didn't really address the fact that it happened the day before, but it really was kind of played out like it was a non-story, and no one nationally picked up on it at all. It just wasn't talked about, and so it died. And then, lo and behold, the next Wednesday, after back-to-back days where there were no tests and the Steelers game had obviously gotten moved, and people thought, all right, the facility's going to reopen, we're going to be on schedule for the Bills game, all of a sudden there's two more positive tests and then another test the next day. And that's when the story kind of resurfaced and there was new information. We did some extra reporting. Paul Kaharski here in Nashville was all over the story as well. And that's when it really became this national story and everybody said, all right, well, now the league's going to pound them because they did this thing. The thing that was never clear, though, is what were the explicit instructions from the league on that Tuesday when they shut down the facility? Were the players explicitly told – you cannot meet anywhere. You cannot throw a pass at a park. You, can, you cannot do anything. Were they told the facility shut down, there's nothing here, you have to go home, and you cannot leave until we tell you so? Or was that not really relayed to them? That was sort of the million-dollar question. And then the other part of it is what would the NFL find from the original genesis of this? You know, was it just simply Greg Maven coming off the street, in which case – Maybe it was the NFL's protocols that weren't good enough as it started. Or was there something else more nefarious, like it was floated out there that Shane Bowen perhaps had close contact with Greg Maven, never told anybody about it, then he tested positive. And obviously as a defensive play caller, he would have fairly close contacts with several people on the team throughout the course of the week. Ultimately, the NFL investigated. It investigated hard. And it's changed a bunch of protocols, which maybe speaks to some of that for all teams in the league to now follow. But what it came up with is, yes, there were cases where Titans players maybe didn't mask up as well as they should have or have it over their nose and mouth at the same time, all of those sort of things. And that the directive when the facility was shut down and what players were supposed to do was not relayed sufficiently enough. But ultimately, they found no malice there. They found no intent in what the Titans were doing. And clearly that seems absurd on its face, right, Colt? No one wants to get COVID-19. No one wants to ruin their season by getting players infected. But ultimately the NFL finished its investigation and and didn't find much fault with the Titans, but I think did definitely want to tighten some loopholes, if you will, for the Titans and everybody else in the league as this season moves forward. Yeah, they definitely had to tighten up some of those loopholes because if you are going to give this leeway of going out, oh, the facility shut down, you can go out and congregate somewhere else. What's the purpose of shutting down the facility then? You can just show up and go straight out to the field instead of going inside, you know, kind of thing and have like a walkthrough type of practice or whatever it may be. Um, sure. So it, you're kind of giving leeway for other teams to do this and you're kind of letting, you know, the Titans not punishing the Titans. You can't all of a sudden later on if some team does this, you can't punch them all of a sudden because – How's it going to look when you let the Titans get off the hook with it and now all of a sudden you're going to tighten it and you're going to hammer someone else for doing it? So it's it's very interesting the way the NFL looked at this whole thing. And I, I also did see that, as you touched on with the mask, they were talking about how players and coaches inside the facility didn't have their mask on at certain points, fine, so be it. Um, 
it's it's very very weird. I saw you. Uh, we were just about to say something else. You just, well, I, I was just going to jump in because I, I certainly hear what you're saying, and I think a lot of people have said that around the league, and certainly fans, definitely fans of the Steelers and Bills have said that because it screwed up their season because of what happened here in Tennessee. But a couple things. One, while the Titans are definitely guilty of not following the mass protocols all the time, from people I've talked to around the league and talking with Titans GM John Robinson, he said it in his media availability during this as well, I don't know if there's a single team in the league that has been 100% when it comes to masks, that players have done it and worn them appropriately every single place they've been throughout the building or on trips or wherever they go all the time. I don't know if you'd find a single team in the league that was 100% compliant. So that's part of the reason that I think the Titans are where they are in this situation that I think the league looked at it and said, yeah, they didn't do this exactly the way they're supposed to, but a lot of teams are. They just happen to be the one that got hit right now. And then the rest of it is I don't think the league was 100% clear with some of the things that they wanted. And obviously this is the first time they had truly shut down a facility. And I don't think they relayed their messages as well as they needed to. And I don't think the Titans then relayed the message to players as well as they needed to. As it was described to me, it was a big miscommunication. Since that has happened, the NFL has been very clear with a series of memos of these are the things we're going to do. One, to try to prevent the start of this from ever happening again in a new facility. But two, when we get to this place, we now have kind of some established protocols that teams and players need to follow when it comes up. And so I think the Titans, I guess, could sort of play the ignorant card that we didn't know. You didn't totally explain this to us. We were kind of flying by the seat of our pants here. And I think that's actually a valid excuse, so to say, with them. And I think the NFL recognized that. I think they've been much more clear now. So in the future, I think that's going to be harder to pull off. But we'll see because they have established this. I don't think they ever want to get to a place where a team's going to forfeit or have to lose draft picks over this unprecedented season. But I do think if they find gross negligence someplace about some of the things they've amended with someone else should this come up again, I think those teams might see punishment because it has been clearly defined. I'm glad you cleared that up, and it does make a lot more sense that if they've, they've made this obvious. If this happens again, we're, we're warning you now, you know, the Titans might not have gotten a full understanding of what we meant, and there might have been, as you said, some loopholes in the text that the NFL has listed out. If it happens again, you, we made this clear now, you're going to face punishment, and I agree with you 1,000%. I do believe other teams were not taking this as seriously, and not just the Titans with inside the facility having your mask off or not covering your mouth and your nose. I guarantee the Titans are not the only team, as you said. Um, now going on to the game ahead and the players involved in it, involved in your Titans. Let's start with the guy that just got paid in the offseason, clearly two guys. We're going to start off with the man at the helm, Ryan Tannehill. He's been unreal. I mean, did not see this coming. It kinda, people kind of thought this was going to be a one-year thing with Tannehill, and the Titans were in a situation where they had to pay him. He was too good not to let walk. Um, he kind of had to pay him, and, man, the Titans got a deal with Ryan Tannehill. He's playing legit football, top 10 guy in the league right now for sure. Let me hear about what your thoughts are on the season for Ryan Tannehill, man. He's been fantastic there. He's been phenomenal. And, honestly, Colton, if you look at it, he's an MVP candidate right now. He's an MVP candidate right now in the 2020 season. But since the moment he took over, and we're right at one year, he became the starting quarterback for the Titans in week seven last year. The Titans are 13-3 and three in regular season games, or if you just want to take the last 16 games and include the postseason, they're 13-3 and three in his last 16 games as well. He took them from a team that was 2-4 and four when he took over last year in week seven to a team that went 7-3 and three down the stretch, got into the playoffs, won back-to-back -back road games in New England, the defending Super Bowl champs, and at Baltimore, who had the best record in the NFL last year, and then went on the road and were leading for most of the first half in Kansas City against the Chiefs, who obviously went on to win the Super Bowl. Tannehill was phenomenal a year ago. He's the most efficient quarterback in the NFL 
in the regular season last year after taking over. He fit the offense perfectly, but I do think there are a lot of people who wondered, was this just kind of the perfect storm? Could he continue it? He can't possibly be that good again, right? Well, he's been every bit that good. He's thrown for 289 yards a game, 70% completion passing, 13 touchdowns and two interceptions. The Titans are second in the league in red zone conversions. He's 12 touchdowns, no interceptions is in the red zone. He's been absolutely phenomenal. And Derrick Henry had a monster game this past weekend. He leads the league in rushing. He is a huge part of what the Titans offense is. It's all built around that. But because of how successful he was a year ago and down the stretch two years ago, the number one line on the scouting report for any defense taking on the Titans is try to slow down Derrick Henry, try to contain him. And so everybody's starting this season with eight, nine guys in the box trying to take away 22. And Ryan Tannehill has stepped up to that challenge and said, okay, if you're going to do that over and over and over again and try to just load the box and stop him and prevent him from going off, I'll beat you with my arm. I'll lead us down the field and get it done if we have to. And he's been absolutely great in that. And Colton, he's been the best in the clutch because while the Titans are 5-0 and this year, four of those wins come by a combined total of 12 points. And so four of those wins have come with field goals in the last two minutes of regulation or Sunday when they drove the field again in the final two minutes of regulation to tie the Texans and then one on the opening drive of overtime. So think about that. In five games this year, Ryan Tannehill has led the game-winning drive in the final two minutes of regulation or in overtime. No other quarterback in the NFL can say that. No, Tannehill's definitely been one of the most underrated guys and underappreciated guys. Where it's like, all right, we're gonna, as you said, you're going to stop Derrick Henry. He's like, okay, all right, you're going to try that? I'm going to beat you with my arm. And he has certainly done that. And he's made team pay. And it, he's got his guy back in A.J. Brown. Um Coming back with the COVID talk here, honestly, that's probably one of the things that benefited the Titans was having a bye week there for a healthy A.J. Brown. And, man, he looks healthy and he's producing. I have him in a few fantasy leagues, so I'm happy to have him back. But he is producing, and, man, he's a number one receiver, and he's a legit number one. It's what they looked for a few years ago when they drafted Corey Davis out of Western Michigan. Um, as he, he's been solid. He's filled in that role. But, man, they drafted him to be the number one guy. A.J. Brown at Ole Miss has certainly been that number one guy, and he's been legit. Tell me a little bit about A.J. Brown. He's been great, and he was certainly needed after this COVID saga because Corey Davis and Adam Humphreys, as you mentioned, were two of the guys that tested positive, and they were unavailable. And A.J. Brown, who's coming off a bone bruise in his knee, hadn't played since week one, comes back against the Bills – just over a week ago in that first game back, the weird Tuesday night game. And he goes out and he leads the team in receiving. He catches a touchdown on the fifth play of the game after a turnover, and it puts the Titans up 7 nothing. He totally changed the dynamic of the offense because of the things he can do. And he made up for the fact that the team's second and third leading receivers weren't there on that night and helped the Titans really have a statement performance against the Bills. That is the best they've played all season long in that game, probably against the best team they've played all season long up to this point. And then he came back on Sunday with two interceptions or two touchdown receptions in that game. He was really good once again, and he stepped up when they needed catches. In the first half, he had a great adjustment on his touchdown right where he wasn't open initially. Neither was anybody else. He read what Tannehill was doing in the pocket. He floated with them, and he found some space. So it's not just – the God-given ability that A.J. Brown has, but it's the what to and it's the smarts that he's demonstrated early in year two in his career to just find spaces, take care of matchups, and get the job done. And then it's also kind of the bravado that you need to have if you're a number one receiver, as you mentioned, in the NFL. I mean, the greats have this, right? The Jerry Rices, the Randy Mosses, the Terrell Owens, the Michael Thomas is the – Antonio Browns, those guys have always had a swagger, maybe at the wide receiver position more than any other place in the NFL. If you are a number one, you have a swagger about you. And towards the end of the game on Sunday, A.J. Brown walked into the huddle and said, Ryan, I don't care what the play is. Come find me. I'm going to make catches for you. And they looked to him. And they looked to him with seven seconds to go in the game when a lot of people thought they were going to spike the ball and try to set things up. Tannehill takes the snap. 
and throws a fade route to the corner of the end zone. And A.J. Brown goes up, makes the catch, somehow gets two feet in on a very difficult catch, and all of a sudden you've got a tie football game. That's the type of thing number one receivers. They want the responsibility. They want to have to make the play, and then they go out there and make it. And that's what A.J. Brown continues to do for these Titans. Absolutely. Going on to another guy with some big news today regarding him, Jonu Smith with a full participant in practice today. So he's going to be active this weekend for the Sears Titans game. That was a little talk, and, uh, you know, I don't really want to see a guy who's been very, very good on the field for the Titans. One of his security blankets, because he's got A.J. Brown back, as we just mentioned, Jonu Smith is having a great 2020, and without A.J. Brown there those first few games, Jonu Smith secured that security blanket spot for Ryan Tannehill. 19 catches, 234, and five touchdowns this season for Janu. There was a lot of talk he wasn't going to play. Clearly, I just broke the news that he is going to be playing this weekend. He had a full participant in practice. Saw this as, as a – saw it pop up as, we're, as I'm talking to you here. So, bring it up ironically. Perfect timing again. Um, what's your talk on Janu Smith? Man, he's a very, very skilled guy at the tight end position and one to watch out for going forward. Yeah, I thought he was poised to have a breakout season, Colton. He's been even better than I could have imagined. He was brought in as the heir apparent to Delaney Walker, who was so good here for so long. And it's really the way the Titans' offense is built. You know, it's nasty. It's built around the run. It's built around play action. It's perfect for the tight end. And Jonu Smith has filled into that role at first because of the injuries to Walker. He maybe had to grow up a little more quickly than the Titans were anticipating or hoping for, but he was solid. And what has happened is over the last couple of years since Mike Vrabel has been here is he's become kind of the, the pet student, if you will. He is a guy that all the coaches love because of his work ethic, because of his diligence in the classroom. I think he was a fairly raw player when he walked into the NFL. He was drafted in the third round off of upside and the possibility that like Delaney Walker, he had a lot of – the skill set that could be an explosive, consistent, every down tight end in the National Football League. But it was a work in progress, and it took a little while. But he has done the work, and he has put in the process to take his game to the next level. And when you ask Mike Grable, hey, do you love any of your players? He'd be like, oh, I, lo- I love them all. But, okay, do you have a favorite player? He'd be like, eh, not really, but I really like Johnny Smith. That's the type of answer that you would get from Mike Vrabel and several of these coaches because of the work that he puts in and the type of player he is. He put in a lot of work in the offseason. Actually, when everything was shut down, he lives in South Florida, not very far from where Ryan Tannehill lives. And so those two got together during the shutdown three or four times a week and threw in a local park down there, which had to help out with their connection heading into the season. And as you mentioned, given everything that's gone on in the receiver core with – A.J. Brown missing two games there. Corey Davis has now missed two games. Adam Humphreys missed a game. Jonu Smith has been a huge part of the offense. He's got five touchdowns already, and really that came in just four games because he was out of the game late in the first half on Sunday against the Texans with that knee injury. The fact he's been back, limited on Wednesday, full participant on Thursday, that's a great sign for the Titans heading into this huge showdown against the Steelers on Sunday. Yeah, going on to the next key piece of this offense on a deal, on a deal for the Titans, how valuable he is. King Henry, Derrick Henry, what a deal for the Titans getting him on the money they got him and Tannehill, might I add, comparing when they look at guys like Ezekiel Elliott. As talented as Zeke is, I get Zeke's more of a receiving back also with the run where Derrick Henry is more that just I'm going to run you over kind of back. Um yeah, Derrick Henry got a deal for the Titans. Derrick Henry's been the best runner in the league this year. Toss around players, hit, hit, wink, wink, Josh Norman getting tossed. It's kind of crazy to see how impressive Derrick Henry has been in his tenure with the Titans. Got paid on a good deal for the Titans, as I just mentioned. What can you say about Derrick Henry? Because, man, everyone sees the, the running over people. But what really kind of showed me was – Deshaun Watson, after the coin toss, throwing his hands up, like, oh, my gosh, we lost the game. We lost the game because these guys are getting the ball back. And you saw on that screen pass or a little check down to Derrick Henry, and you didn't see a Texan in view because they didn't want to tackle him. And that's kind of proven the main story of Derrick Henry. You don't want to tackle this guy late in games. Have fun trying to tackle him in the fourth quarter or overtime. 
Tell me a little bit about Derek Henry because, man, this guy is insane. Fourth quarter of games, fourth quarter of the season, he's just a guy that wears on you. It's 6'3", 247 pounds. You don't want to have to tackle that 25 times in a game, which is what he's pretty much averaging for carries so far this season. I'll tell you what, Colton, since the end of November in the 2018 season, Derrick Henry's been the best running back in the NFL, and there's no question about that. There isn't a debate. He has been the best running back in the NFL by a wide margin. And some people have, you know, asked questions about does he fit with other teams? How valuable would he be in other places? And I don't know that question. If you tried to make him Ezekiel Elliott – or you tried to fit him on the Seahawks or the Bears or the Packers. I don't know if he has the same effect as he does in Tennessee, but he is the perfect back for this offense and what they're going to do. Perhaps that's why he didn't garner a ton, a ton of interest in initially in the offseason from people talking about deals with him. But ultimately the Titans – put the franchise tag on, and then they worked out a, a long-term deal, four years, $50 million, which seems like a steal at this point. But he's the perfect back for what they want to do. And it's not just his quality. You're right. Nobody wants to tackle, and nobody wants to get in his way. But if you watched on Sunday against the Texans, not just that screen pass where he was already in the open field, but how about the 94-yard run in the fourth quarter where the Titans are backed up, they're trailing in the game, at the moment, they're just trying to get out of the shadow of their own goalpost. He gets through the line of scrimmage, essentially as a safety coming up on him, who he, he kind of runs around stiff's arms, and he gets in the open field, and no one can catch him. So it's the physical part at first, but then when he gets into the open field, if he gets a step on you, I don't care if you're a cornerback or a safety or a linebacker, you're not catching him at 6'3", 247. And that's the thing that truly sets him apart. Because we've seen fast running backs, and we've seen big running backs that could run downhill and be physical and pop you in the mouth all the game long. I'm not sure if we've ever really seen the combination of a guy that is that big and that durable and comes at you over and over and over in the way he does. But also when he gets in the open field – gets clocked at 21.6 miles per hour like he did on Sunday and just runs by everybody else on the field. As he said after the game, look, I don't know what to tell you. When I get the ball, the only thing I'm looking at is the end zone because I believe I'm going to go there and you can't stop me. And if you're in my way, I'm either going to run over you, run around you, or run by you. And that's just my motivation and that's what I believe. And it's hard to argue with it because he does it a lot. He does it quite often, coming off a 16-touchdown season and only 15 games for Derrick Henry. He looks to blow that number wide open. Kind of been some talks. I saw it on uh, ESPN, uh, I think a few days ago. There was talks. Is Derrick Henry an MVP candidate? And at the pace he's kind of at, it's kind of hard not to like toss his name in. Again, it's very hard for a running back to get the most valuable player in the league of passing. But right now, his name's got to be in the conversation. He's leading the league in rushing by almost 100 yards with Clyde edwards Hilaire, who's probably going to get that number slashed a little bit with Le'Veon Bell coming into that picture. Derrick Henry might run away with his rushing title again. And my gosh, he's doing it in style. Derrick Henry taking over the league by storm. Going on to the guy behind everything here. Mike, v- Mike Vrabel, excuse me. He's been kind of talked, again, I, all I do is watch sports. He's kind of been talked – lately on these sports waves here on possibly being the next star head coach of the league. We had that little taste a few years ago with Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan last year going to the Super Bowl. He's kind of the guy. There's We expected, as we talked about going into the show here, talked about how we everyone expected their doors to get blown off the Titans talking about here by the Buffalo Bills, who were one of the hottest teams in the league going into that game. Everyone was buying that Buffalo Bills stock, as I certainly was. I'm a big Josh Allen guy, so I was buying that stock. I'm like, this is kind of a game for Tennessee to get steamrolled, um, not having these games played, and not being in the facility this long. It was kind of one of those things, they're going to get their doors blown off here. And Mike Vrabel said there was going to be no excuses. We're, we're good to go, however it's going to happen. And, man, was he certainly a man of his word because they were prepared and punched 
Buffalo in the mouth. It wasn't just a shot. It was a punch in the gut for the Bills. Tell me a little bit about Mike Vrabel because, man, he's taking over the League West Storm. And you usually don't see that after Bill Belichick, guys. Guy that's kind of under Bill Belichick. You usually haven't seen this success. You saw, um, oh, my gosh, um, Matt Patricia, there was his name. Matt Patricia in Detroit, you all thought the tough guy attitude, how that was going to work out. Yeah, that hasn't worked out at all in Detroit. Tell me a little bit about Mike Vrabel. Man, the guy's, guy's good at his job. Let's, let's say that. So I'm going to sound like a homer in the praise I'm about to heap on him. So I want to preface it by this, that anybody who's around Nashville two years ago when he first got here and some of the decisions he made early on in his first season, I was as hard on him on the radio and in some TV things and in columns I wrote as just about anybody. I thought he came in with a lot of bravado. I, I mean, literally in his introductory press conference, he basically picked fights with the media. And we're like, why are you guys asking questions about things that are on the wall in front of you in here that are clearly different than a week ago when I wasn't the head coach here? You know, he he did those sort of things right out of the gun. He went for two in a game that they were dominating in the second half at the end of the game in London against the Chargers and didn't get it and lost the game on that play. And everybody was sort of like, why didn't you go to overtime? In that situation, it was actually very similar to a decision he had on Sunday against the Texans. He went for the extra point, went into overtime, marched right down the field, won the game. So I was very critical early on because I thought he had a lot of bravado. I thought at times he outsmarted himself. I think he he's such a player's coach that sometimes he thought or coached as a player. And it was like, yes, let's go for it on fourth and three here. Or let's go for two in the win, even when that wasn't the right decision for the moment. But I think he's learned a lot from that. I think he's been much more measured in his risks that he's taken since those moments. I think he's been really smart. I think they're almost always prepared with good game plans. I think the team is disciplined. I think they take on his attitude that there are no excuses. I mean, you think about this COVID situation and the excuses there could have been. They essentially practiced once in the span of two weeks. They were out of the building for more than 11 days. They had a walkthrough and a practice, essentially, before they took the field 16 days after their last game against a team that was unbeaten, and they blew the doors off them. And that, I think, comes back to the Vrabel philosophy that it doesn't matter. We've got a game to go play. We've got to be prepared the best that we can, and we're expected to go execute when we get out there. And the guys embraced that, and they sort of took all the hate from the guy – from the outside and they used his motivation. I just think he's been really, really good with what he's done. That's a good example of when his back was against the wall a couple years ago. He had his star quarterback out. He had his star tight end loss for the season. He had both tackles out for the second game of the season. And he somehow schemed up a plan to beat the Texans at home, a Texans team that, by the way, went on to win the AFC South. So Mike Vrabel has been at his best when people count him out. I think he's super smart. I think he's really prepared. And even if you want to look at that game on Sunday against the Texans before that final drive to tie it, and this kind of hit some of the social media streams over the week, there was a situation with about three minutes to go in the game where the Texans had gotten nine yards on first down, and they're winning the game by, at the time, just one. But they were in scoring position, and the Titans had all three timeouts left, just over three minutes left, and it was second and one. And Vrabel sent a seldom-used defensive back on the field to pick up an on-purpose 12 men on the field bell, which what that does, and this is genius, is it stops the clock, doesn't force you to use a timeout, automatically gives them the first down, which, let's face it, when it's second and one, the likelihood of them getting it is pretty high anyway. And the other thing it did is it moved them into a place on the field where they were then inside the 20-yard line, which meant that they could only get one more first down before they would have to score a touchdown or they'd be out of downs. He at a minimum saved the Titans a timeout and 40 seconds, possibly more depending on how long it would have taken them to pick up that yard and if they would have picked up enough in which they wouldn't have been able to grab another set of downs based off of where they were on the field. Ultimately, the Texans scored. 
Titans got a stop on the two-point conversion. They were down seven, but they got the ball back with a minute 45 and a timeout left. They, it likely would have been a minute five with no timeouts left. Maybe much worse situation than that if he doesn't make that move. Obviously, they go down and they score with four seconds left to tie it. But that's the type of thing that nobody in the NFL really does. Maybe Bill Belichick, the guy he once played for, but nobody else in the NFL is thinking at that level. Mike Vrabel has shown an aptitude on multiple occasions throughout his career of thinking ahead to the next level and being really smart in game management situations. And that was just another example that maybe helped this team stay undefeated on Sunday. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's what he was going to ask you next was that play that he decided to send in a player that did not mean anything just to save more time that people would not have thought about, a normal coach, not going to lie to you. And it just shows how smart he is. And talking about Bill Belichick, Belichick did that a few uh, last year against the Jets. Uh, I think it was, it was on a punt. They kept getting false starts and like a delay a game, and it kept taking time off the clock. And ironically – when Mike Brabel played the Patriots last year, he did it to Bill Belichick and stuck it to him, used his own tricks against him. And you saw Belichick getting pissed off on the sideline. Might have been one of the funniest things I saw of last season. Um, yeah, Mike Brabel, man, he's just one of the upcoming guys in this league. And how funny is he to be around? I know how he's tough with the media, but seeing some of the quotes have come out about him over the last few years. He had a quote with Lamar Jackson last year out. Uh, might as well tie this guy's shoes, tie his uh, shoelaces together. That's pretty much the only way you're going to tackle him. How funny is a guy like Mike Vrabel to be around, you know, just from players talking about him? So this is never going to happen because we're not that close. I don't think he's that close with any of us in the media here in Nashville or probably nationwide. But I would love to have a beer with him sometime in the off season or whatever, just to talk about some of these things. Because truly, I think he's really smart. And I think you can learn a lot about the game from just being around him. I also think he's got a great personality. I think it would be funny. I think he'd have some incredible stories to tell from his playing days and his coaching days. So I think that would be really fun. From a coach to the media standpoint, he's kind of standoffish. I mean, even today, it was very clear he was just over talking to us. Maybe it's because we're doing everything on Zoom these days. But we got nothing to that. And it wasn't funny. It wasn't really informative. It was just how quickly can I get this over and move on to the next thing? He certainly has those days. But he's also – he's fun back and forth with you. He does have the one-liners about as well as any coach in the NFL does. And at times I think you can learn from him in certain things he's going to say. He's not going to say anything that he thinks is going to give away anything. But there are some moments that he does divulge some things that I do think help you as – a media member and trying to cover the team and best represent what's going on. So I think he's played it pretty well as a mix from that opening press conference when he sort of attacked us right off the bat, totally unfounded. I was worried. I thought this could go south very quickly in terms of our relationship, but actually it's been pretty good. So I wish we had more access. And right now I wish it wasn't all on Zoom, but I will say this, the place he's the most funny is in these Zoom conversations I don't know how many people out there who are listening have been through these sort of meetings the way they're set up like press conferences, but all the conversation from the reporter to the coach and back is done over a a Zoom conversation like we're doing, where you hear the audio, you see the audio, you see the person. But everything behind the scenes and the media relations person calling on you is done via the chat function of the Zoom. Well, very quickly into the season, Mike Grable realized that's what was going on, So he started jumping in the chats with us and he's making fun of people's questions and their profile pictures and all those sort of things that's (laughs) going on. So that part has been hilariously entertaining. And that's the one maybe positive if there are any positives to us not actually being in person because that wouldn't happen there. That's kind of funny to hear. See, like that's stuff you don't hear about. And from a guy like you just mentioned, I was so kind of like tough with the media, Belichicky like, um, that's kind of funny to hear. But going on, our final topic here, going into this weekend, it, it, we have a clash of the AFC here. The teams that kind of weren't really expected to be in this situation in the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Tennessee Titans. So what are you expecting this year? You got uh, this week, you have a tough rush defense in Pittsburgh without Devin Bush. Then you have a great offensive line there in Tennessee without their key piece in Taylor Lewan. 
What do you see as a final outcome this weekend, and what kind of game are you expecting to see out of these two great teams in the AFC? I think it's going to be a physical, tough battle. It's going to be a grind on both sides of the football. I think the strength of the Titans is the offense. I think the strength of the Titans is their running game and how they do play action off of it. I think the strength of the Steelers is their defense. I think their strength is how they match up against run games, and I think it's how they play against the pass down the field. And so I think you have strength against strength on that side of the ball. I think Ben Roethlisberger's come back and look great for the Steelers offensively. And I think the Titans have struggled at times this year. If you have a concern as a Titans fan, it's the fact that all their pieces defensively either haven't been there Dory Jackson still hasn't played yet this year. J.J. Van Clown and Vic Beasley are still working themselves into form after joining the team late. Will those pieces come back? Will they ever reach sort of their full potential this year? And can they combine everything together and get back to the place that they have been over the last several years as a really good defense? I think the pieces are there. The question is whether they can find that chemistry and put it together in time to get back to that level this year. And certainly if they can do it in time for a noon kickoff on Sunday against Big Ben, and the Steelers. I think it's going to be a great matchup. Colton, I would give the Steelers the edge right now. I think they're about a one or a one and a half point favorite. To me, that seems right because I think they've been the more consistent team. I think they've been the more dominant team. I think they've been the better team on both sides of the ball as opposed to the Titans kind of being an offensive juggernaut really to this point of the season. I think it's going to be a good game. I do give the Steelers the edge. The other thing I think about that is under normal circumstances, you give the home field, what, three points in a game like this? How much does the home field really matter right now when you only have maybe 10,000 people there? So I think that takes away from some of it too. So maybe in the normal sense, if it was going to be 68,000 Titans fans there, well, maybe that swings to a pick em game or a Titans minus one type of game. But that factor this weekend, it's – Going to be just two teams out there on the field going at it. I think the Steelers have been slightly more consistent this year on both sides of the ball. I think they've obviously been more healthy for the most part. And I think the loss of Taylor Lalonde, who we haven't mentioned, we definitely should, the Pro Bowl left tackle for the Titans who tore his ACL early in the second half against the Texans on Sunday, is a huge loss for this team. Now, the Titans have backups. They have guys in that situation. They should be able to put this offensive line together in a way that can be good moving forward for the rest of the season. But can they do it in time to turn around one week later against a defense as good with ends as good as the Steelers? That is a monster question. And can they frankly be great, which is what this line was with Taylor Lalonde out there? That will remain to be seen probably beyond this weekend and for the foreseeable future. It's just a question they're going to have to answer. And so – that is a big storyline to me going into the game. For that reason, I think the Steelers have the slight edge. But, again, I've learned my lesson with this Titans team. Oftentimes, they play their absolute best when other people count them out. When other people think they have no shot, going to New England, going to Baltimore in the playoffs, when they were 2-4 and four last year in the regular season, when they were coming off of COVID this year, that's when they come out and they have their best game. So I guarantee you the Titans are going to be prepared. They're going to be ready. They're going to come out, and they're going to be ready to tangle with the Titans or with the Steelers for a full 60 minutes on Sunday. Will it be enough? We'll find out. I give the Steelers a slight edge, but I guarantee you the Titans will be ready. I believe they will be ready also under Mike Vrabel, who we all thought, as I mentioned earlier, would not be ready for that Buffalo game. And, yeah, they were ready for it. So I expect this team to be ready. And, yeah, my prayers and wishes are to Taylor Lewan. Ironically, both Michigan guys do go down, Michigan fans. So, ironically, Devin Bush and Lewan both go yeah. down. Um, would have liked to see both those guys in this contest here this weekend. But I do believe the Steelers have a slight edge. Also, I agree. I think Ben is playing terrific football. Very underrated this season. Um, I know we just have the flashy numbers like Dak Prescott, Adam, this, that, and the other. But I do believe Ben not having a guy like Antonio Brown. I've kind of talked about this personally with his people about the Steelers. I think not having Antonio Brown, as talented as Antonio Brown is, and there's rumors with him with Seattle right now, I think it's better off for the Steelers. And I think Ben's not forcing him the ball, and Ben's taking the plays that are necessary. He's got James Washington, another solid receiver, Deontay Johnson. Juju Smith-Schuster, who we all thought was the number one receiver, who's not putting number one stats up. It's the guy out of Notre Dame, Chase Claypool, was putting those numbers up. 
and you're not having Juju going and crying, ah, I need the ball, I need the ball. He's We're winning. I'm happy as heck. So I think that also plays into this Steelers offense being as well as they played right now with Big Ben. I, I agree with you, and let's not lose sight of this fact. I don't know if there's a team in the NFL that has been better than the Steelers over the last – decade or so, maybe 15 years with ben, Big Ben there, that has been better at going out and identifying receivers in the draft, whether they be high picks or whether they be guys that they kind of work on once they bring them in, and plugging them into that system and getting great performances out of them almost immediately. For so long, because Antonio Brown was so great, I think people just sort of mistook the fact that it was Big Ben and it was Le'Veon and it was Antonio. It was kind of this three-headed monster. But really, there were a bunch of wide receivers there that were a part of what this was. And that goes back a while. And you mentioned the cast of guys now, Johnson and Smith-Schuster and Claypool and, and Washington. They all have a little bit of a different skill set, but they all do it very, very well. Big Ben is enjoying the versatility he has and the amount of guys he can throw it to. And that offense right now is clicking. And Big Ben, despite the elbow injury, missing last year in the surgery, to me right now, he looks like a guy that could be a 28-year-old quarterback and not a guy that's in the last, you know, handful of years of his career. Instead of me sounding like a homer here with the Steelers, something I am looking into with this weekend, though, the Steelers have only played one game on the road. and Big Ben's numbers have not been good on the road over his career. Um, again, a lot of guys aren't that good uh, on the road compared to at home, which not just to Ben, Ben's fault, but they've only put one at New York, clear with no fans, going to Tennessee for the first time, and they got three road games in a row. So this is what I do find interesting about the Steelers. It's time to see how good the Steelers team is. They're going on the road for the first time, like I said, since week one in the NFL. Week one, and it's time to put up or shut up for the Steelers, I think. This is kind of a big test. They're going up against one of the best rushing uh, offenses in the league, with Derek Henry clear, they shut down Kareem Hunt, that number one offense in rushing with the Browns. That's to be my key point of this game. Can they shut down the run? But as we've said in this whole conversation, Ryan Tannehill can beat you with his arm. And he's getting Corey Davis back with Adam Humphreys, a healthy John New Smith who's going to be active this week, and A.J. Brown clearly. We're in for a game, man. I can't wait, and I'll definitely be talking to you about it during the game and after the game. It's definitely something I'm looking forward to. And, Cole, I'll leave you with two thoughts or two keys for this game. When the Titans have the ball, I believe it's first down. When the Steelers have the ball, I believe it's third down. And here's why. Especially without Taylor Luan, the Titans want to run the ball on first down. They run the ball on first down as much, if not more, than anybody in the league. The Steelers are good against the run, but they're not great directly up the middle. Can the Titans run the ball consistently on first down where they play ahead of the chains? You don't have to get eight yards, but can you get three or four and move into second and six, second and five, and so on and so forth? Because even if they get to third and three or third and four, you're going to like Ryan Tannehill's chances there to continue this offense to move down the field. And I think the Titans will put up a lot of points if that's the case. If they play behind the chains, it completely chains, changes what the offense is going to look like. So watch the Titans – on first down in this game and how effective they are and if they can play in front of the chains. And then for the Steelers, watch third down because the Titans have been the worst defense in the league. It's hard to believe that, that they can be this and be 5-0. and But they have been the worst defense in the NFL at getting off the field on third down. Even in that game against the Bills, they gave up 13 of 17 third down conversions in that game. The Titans have to be better than that because the Pittsburgh offense and Big Ben, they're just too good. If you can't get off the field at all, if they're converting at more than 50% on third down, they're going to crush you on first and second down, and they're going to put up a ton of points. So the Titans have to be better than what they've been through the first five games this season on third down. If not, it's going to be a long day. So watch out for those two things. First down for the Titans, third down for the Steelers. How those downs go – Based off of the offense versus the defense, I think we'll tell you a lot about the victor on Sunday. Another point before we wrap this up, I also believe the Steelers' back end is susceptible if they do bring the blitz and they do not get home. The Steelers' back end is very vulnerable for deep shots, which this also could be a key point of this game. Can the Titans get those deep shots on the Steelers' defense? And as we said, can they hold up against us? Fantastic rush with Bud Dupree, T.J. Watt, Cam Hayward, and Stefan Tui. Can they hold up? 
Well, Steve, I do yeah. want to thank you for this show. This was definitely one I was – I'm definitely excited about. Can't wait to get it out, and this was definitely a fun conversation. You bet, Colton. Glad to do it. Enjoy the game on Sunday, and hopefully we'll talk again soon. Absolutely. You can follow Steve on Twitter, at Steve Lehman. Definitely be in the description. Everything will be posted where you can follow him and check him out on Channel 5 in Nashville. Steve, again, thank you very much. You bet, man. Take care.